It's about the treasure inside of me. I don't want you to worship me. I want you to worship the one who is in me, which is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. <laughs> Remove all of those standards of beauty of the world and just say, God, thank you for making me the way that you've made me. Today's message, the title is Vessels. That we are called by God to be vessels. Now I want to read scripture to you. If we can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to be reading from verse 6 all the way to verse 11. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 and we're going to read till verse 11. So this is where the word of God says. It says, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Say earthen vessels. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. Perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Somebody say amen. Okay, so what's going on here is that the Apostle Paul is saying that all of us, we are earthen vessels. Other Bible versions may have said jars of clay, but it's meaning the same thing. It means the same thing. See, jars of clay and, and, and earthen vessels are referring to things that come out of the ground. You know, clay is made out of mud. So earthen vessels as well, made out of mud. So what is it saying here? It is saying that all of us, regardless of who we think we are, we're a vessel for something. You're either a vessel for God or you're a vessel for the world. We choose. And what makes the difference is what we put in us. Because a vessel, if you think of it like a cup, a cup is defined by what is in it. So here's what, what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, first of all, we are all earthen vessels, jars of clay. We on our own don't have value in the sense of that we in ourselves, there's no glory about us. But what is the glory? The glory is the treasure that God has placed in our earthen vessels. You know, earth, clay, if you look at clay, clay are one of the easiest objects to break, right? It tips over, it smashes, it breaks, but here what the Apostle Paul is saying is that is this, is that God has entrusted to the church, to every believer, to put a treasure in us. What is this treasure? He says the treasure is Jesus Christ. And I would argue as well that the treasure that is inside of us is the presence of the Holy Spirit. All of us have that treasure inside of us, the Holy Spirit in us. And look at what it's saying here. First of all, Paul calls him treasure. That means that Jesus must become your treasure. And if he becomes your treasure, it changes your worth. It changes how people look at you and see you. And this is important because even Jesus says this. He says that where your treasure is, your heart will be there as well. What is the heart? The heart is what defines who you really are. It changes you. Depending on the attitude of your heart, because your heart is your true self, Whatever your heart is like, that's what you're going to be like in your earthen vessel. That's what you will reflect in your life. Now, in the same way, if Jesus becomes your treasure and your treasure is where your heart is, that means that when Jesus is at our heart, we become more like Jesus. And that is what this world needs. They don't need to see more jars of clay. They need to see the treasure that's inside of those jars of clay. The world is sick and tired of looking at Christians because they see our humanity. What they need to see is Christ in us, the hope of glory. You need to become like Christ is what the Bible is saying here. The Apostle Paul is saying you must reflect Christ in you. That when people look at you, they will say, that's what Christ is like. This changes your character. This changes how you speak. This changes how you live out your life. Can I tell you something? That your life might be the only Bible someone will ever read in their life. 
What are you showing the world? Are you showing the world a weak God, a God that can't change anybody, a God that can't help anybody, a God that is defeated and depressed? Or are you showing people who the true God is, a God of power, a God that can change people's lives, a God that can deliver, a God that can do miracles, signs, and wonders? We don't preach a dead God. We preach a God that is alive. And if he is alive, let him be manifest in you, the Bible is saying. Manifest in you. And look at here where it says, it says that what we must do is that because Christ is in us, we also, what we reflect is the power of God. Now, power can mean, of course, character. And I've heard a lot of more conservative Christians preach it this way, that it's just about changing in your character to be more like Christ. But I would argue, and I'm about to show you closer to the end of the preaching, but I will show you how that word power also means literally the spiritual power of God. Because Jesus wasn't just a good person here on earth. Jesus was a person. If you look at the fullness of Christ, he was a miracle worker. He did deliverance. He broke people out of their, their circumstances. So we need to understand, if we're going to show the fullness of Christ, I must literally show not just his character, but also his power. Okay, we're going to get there in a second. Okay. So look, it says earthen vessel. It can be jars of clay. And let me tell you something, that earthenware or earthen vessel, it comes from the same root words as we say humanity, humans. It comes from the word humus, which means dirt. Humans need to be reminded that we're just dirt. But when Christ comes upon us, when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we stop just being dirt. We now become people that God wants to glorify and God wants to establish as leaders here on earth. So I, I want you to, to look at this, Jeremiah 18.3. So Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 3, I want you to see this. It says, then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now just a little bit of context and then how this applies to our life. The context here is that Jeremiah is prophesying that because the people of Israel were making mistakes and they were sinning, the Bible says that the curses of the law applied into their life and a nation would come to destroy them and conquer the, their land. So the Israelites were being prophesied by Jeremiah that if you're not careful, if you don't change your ways, that what will happen is just like this clay, you'll be destroyed. But then God gives a promise. He then says, but even when the world tries to destroy you, I am like this potter that what is mashed up and smashed, I as a potter can rebuild it into something beautiful. And he was talking about the nation of Israel. But also, did you know that also prophetically you become the new nation of Israel, the new church, the body of Christ. And let me tell you something, the same promise applies to your life. The enemy will try to crush you. He will try to put pressure on your life. But we need to confess the word of God and say, the Bible tells us like the potter, even if I'm pressed down, God is going to mold me into something better. If I lost that thing, God is going to restore it to something better. If God closed the door here, he's going to open another door over there. So I don't know who I'm preaching to. People who feel defeated. People who feel like they've messed up so bad that they're so far away from God and they can never get restored and right with God ever again. I'm here to tell you, it's that God is a potter. No matter how much you feel that you're so distant from God, if you turn back to him, watch him mold you back and restore you and rebuild you. He can rebuild you, but turn to him as your Lord and Savior. So I need you to know, just like the, just now it's making sense what we were reading in 2 Corinthians. It said, look, we are, we are aff afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You tell that to the devil. Maybe you struck me down, but I'm not destroyed. The just rises up seven times. I will get back up. I'm going to get restored again. I'm going to live for Christ. 
So here, this, this is what the Bible is saying. We can be rebuilt, because, but we need to surrender ourselves to the hands of the potter. If you don't allow yourself to be molded by God, to change you, then he will not be able to shape you into your purpose. And this is important. Let me tell you this. The greatest purpose that clay can serve is to be moldable. Let that sink in for a moment. The greatest purpose that clay can ever serve is to be moldable. Because a clay that is rough and can't be molded, then it's like, sorry, let me move on to another clay. But when we allow ourselves to be molded, God is saying, I can shape you into somebody. I can use you. This is why the devil likes to fill people up with pride, stubbornness. God, I don't need you. I don't need you to shape me. I know who I am. I don't, I don't have to listen to anybody. I don't need to change for anybody. God says you're not being moldable. I can't work with you unless you're moldable, unless you're humus, humble, human. Amen? So I want you to see this. So we need to turn back to God and surrender to him for him to mold us. Now, I want to read another passage to you, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to read uh, from verse 20 and 21. Once again, the second book of Timothy, chapter 2, verse 20. And what we have is say amen. Amen. Awesome. So it says, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Like I said, whether you choose to be or not, we're all a vessel for something. And the Bible here is saying, he's talking to Timothy. Paul, as, as his apostle, he's talking to a pastor called Timothy. And he says to Timothy, you need to understand what type of vessel you want to be. You need to decide from now what vessel you will be. Will you be a vessel for the world, transferring ideas of the world and knowledge of the world and creativity of the world and just things of the world? Or will you be a vessel that preaches my gospel? And not only that, but he was then saying, he was, look, you, there's different types of vessels in a, in a house. Let's use a modern term. There's different kind of cups and plates in everyone's home. And what he was saying here is this. Some of these plates are for dishonor, and some of these plates are used for honor. An example I can think of is, you know, I would never eat off of my dog's uh, water plate, right? His bowl that I fill with water, I would never dare eat from there. Why? It's a bowl. A bowl is a bowl, isn't it? It's just a vessel. No. It's defined by its use. And it's defined by what it fills itself with. And that bowl, I use it to put in dog water or just, you know, fountain water or whatever. And my dog slobbers on it. I'm not going to eat from it because that's a, now a bowl of dishonor. But what am I going to use? I want to use a clean plate. I don't want to use one that a dog has licked up. I want to use one that has been washed. And that's what he's saying here. If you want to be used by God, God is looking for clean plates to use. And what do I mean by this? You cannot achieve that in your own strength, of course. I cannot make myself holy, but who makes me holy is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is in you, he cleanses you to be used by the master. But, but Paul get, gets specific, and he says, if you cleanse yourself from these things, what are these things? If you read before uh, verse 20, he starts talking about the things that defile us, right? Um, you know, like sexual immorality. He talks about how uh, problems and fights with people, hating people, being uh, an unforgiving person. All of these things, Paul is saying, cleanse ourselves from this. Because unless we cleanse ourselves from this, we cannot be used for God. But it's saying here, look at this. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself for these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Can I ask you something? Do you just want to be a common vessel or do you want to be a vessel meant for the glory of God? I want you to think about this for a moment. Well, let me give you this, another example that, uh, you know, my mom at ho in, in our home uh, you know, she would always have these, uh, these porcelain plates or china plates. And these special 
plates were so well designed, they were so beautiful, and uh, the thing is that sometimes the dishes would pile up at home. And rather than want to wash the dishes, I'd be like, let me just go and grab one of these, you know, beautiful plates, and you know what, I just, I just want to use it. It's a plate. Anytime I would try to grab it, my mom would correct us and say, no, that's for specific use when special guests are over. So if you go to my mom's house and she doesn't bring out those plates, you know, you ain't special. <laughs> but uh, she would always say, no, these plates are only for this special use of special guests. Don't touch them. And that's what Paul is saying here. There are certain dishes at home in the house of the master that God reserves for such a time. There are certain people that are common, but others that are for special use. And I want to ask again, do you feel like you're called to just common use? Because if you see yourself for common use, you will treat yourself commonly. But if you recognize that God has reserved you for such a time as this, you would reserve yourself. You would say, God, I am a willing vessel. Cleanse me. Purify my heart. I want to be used. But that's the thing. I know in my heart, I'm not meant for common use. I'm meant for something greater. And I know that you echo that same sentiment in your heart, that you're meant for something more. Something in you is telling you that. I'm not meant for common. I'm meant for the glory of God. So we are vessels. And, and like I said, what is in you defines you. You know, the word holy, what it truly means is to be separated for a particular use. That's what holiness means. So when God says be holy, he is saying separate yourself for a specific use. Don't be common. Don't be like a regular vessel that everyone uses. Reserve yourself for the Lord. Okay. Now what else is that vessels, in order for them... Uh, to, to be used, remember we said it needs to be cleansed and also it needs to be emptied out and then refilled. See, the pattern that we see in the Bible is this, that God always asks us to be filled. But in order to be filled, we must empty out what we've already received. When you've received something from God, it is time for you to pour that out. If you want something more from God, pour out what you do have and God fills you with more. Okay, so this is what it means to be continuously filled, all right? And also, what else does being, uh, being cleansed means? Yes, it means to be purified by the Holy Spirit, surrendering ourselves for his work, but also to be cleansed means deliverance. Deliverance. What is deliverance? Deliverance is to be able to be cleansed in our spiritual life as well because we know that the spiritual realm is very real. The demonic, it's real. And the thing is that the devil likes to be hidden, pretend like, you know, he doesn't exist, and he'd rather and prefer to be hidden. But we know that there is a very real word and world out there, and the Bible says, do not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. We know that there's a demonic realm, and because of that, we need to be cleansed from that. We need to be set free and delivered from that. And so we need to understand that deliverance is part of the ministry of God. Let me tell you this. Jesus is more concerned with cleaning you from the inside than rather than the outside. The problem, this was the problem with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were clean from the outside. You looked at them and they wore the best suit. They had the biggest scrolls showing everybody, look, I know and have all this knowledge. And they were clean, spick and span on the outside. But Jesus says, on your inside, you're like, you're like tombs. You're dead. And he would look at them and say, you're not clean from the inside. So what, what Jesus, what mattered to Jesus more was whether they were clean on the inside rather than being cleaned on the outside. And that's the thing. Why? Why is this so important for the Christian today? I'm not saying don't wear suits or, you know, dress how you feel you want to, you know, dress and honor the Lord and give respect to him or how you want to be used by the Lord. But here's what I'm saying this. A suit does not minister to people. It's what's on, in the inside of you that can minister to someone. It's what you carry. It's your relationship with God that ministers to other people. And this is what I'm saying. Do your own style however you feel most comfortable to deliver the word of God. But it's what you're, is on the inside. It's not so much about looking all holy and speaking, you know, holy. If you have not changed on the inside, you have not changed. We need to be set free from the inside out. Okay, now I, I want to I wanna say this. Vessels are also for display. 
right? Vessels are for displays, for a special use to be displayed. Because many people say, well, I want to be a vessel for the Lord, but I want to be hidden. And I want to be in the background. I don't really want to be on the, on the, you know, I don't want anyone to see me. But can I tell you something that Jesus addresses this? He says, you are a light on a hill. And when you are a light, who puts a light under a basket? Well, that's confronting. Because I used to just want to be in the background. I was like, Lord, you know, no, no I, I just want to be used in the background, please. I, I'm, I'm too afraid of, you know, being at the, at the front. And, and God confronted me with that particular Bible verse. And he said, you are a light. And if I've made you light, it's to shine, not to hide you. So if God has set you a light over a hill, it's to light the society, to light the world, to shine in your home. God wants to use you. And so see yourself as a vessel that God wants to use. Now, this is the thing. Some people don't want to be out in the open. Some of it is spiritual, the spiritual battle that they battle with the enemy. But sometimes it's also because you're not comfortable with your earthen vessel. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we don't realize our worth. Can I, uh, let me just read this before I make another point. Isaiah 45, 9. I want you to see this. Isaiah 45, 9. It says, woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, which means who fights with their maker. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Look at this. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say he has no hands? What is being said here is Isaiah is confronting what is, see, there's nothing new under the sun. The same battles that people have today in modern society were battles that people had in ancient times. They were uncomfortable with how they looked. They were uncomfortable with their bodies, perhaps. They were uncomfortable. They just, you know, some people, they look in the mirror and they say, God, and, and ask questions like this. Will the clay say to the potter, you know, what are you making? What did you do? Do you look in the mirror and say, God, why did you give me a big nose? God, why didn't you make me tall? I wanted to be tall. And this is what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah says, who are you as the clay to tell your master, why did you make me like this? Because when you complain and when you're so, you know, focused on what you are not, you will never be used by God for who you are and what he's created you to be. And the issue here is this, that we need to undo and unpack all of these layers. You know, even the standards of beauty of society and commercials and songs and everywhere in Hollywood, all of those standards of beauty, when someone looks at themselves, they begin to question and say, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I don't have the worth. Let me tell you something. The Bible even says that the Apostle Paul, and he wasn't afraid to say, he said that there was nothing impressive with how he looked. In fact, some people argue that Paul was, was ugly. But he didn't even focus on that. He, he, he even said, well, if I'm ugly, whatever. It's about the treasure inside of me. I don't want you to worship me. I want you to worship the one who is in me, which is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. <laughs> Remove all of those standards of beauty of the world and just say, God, thank you for making me the way that you've made me. I don't know if many people can say that here in this place today. Thank you, Lord, for making me the way you made me. There are lots of things that we cannot change. You have, there's choices that we can make in life. You can choose what career you're going to have. You can choose who you're going to marry. You can choose God. But one thing that, the things that we did not have choice in were the things that the master, the potter, did for us. I don't get to choose the color of my skin. I don't get to choose what color my eyes were. I don't get to choose whether my hair was curly or not. I don't get to choose my gender. What we need to say is just, God, thank you for who I am, and I submit myself to the master, the potter. You know what you did, and I'm excited. This is echoed even in Psalm 139, 14, where it says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You need to be able to say that in front of a mirror. In Jesus' name, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, God, that you've given me what I have. I have two functioning legs. Well, Lord, I'm going to use it for your glory. I'm going to preach your gospel. Thank you for these hands you've given to me. Lord, I'm going to use it to worship you and lay my hands on the sick. I will thank you for what I have and who I am. And so that's what, it's, what it is. It's about surrendering to the potter. Are you allowing yourself to be moldable? God 
Thank you for what you've given to me. And to be content in that and say, God, use me regardless. And can I tell you something? God is an expert at using at what other people ignore. God is an expert of using the unknown people in anonymity. Well, that's a hard word to say. Those who are in the anonymous. <laughs> those who are in the background. God is an expert to bring those people that no one else sees and brings them out for display of his glory. Amen. You will never live a joyful life upset of who you are. Being upset who you are. You know, you need to recognize and say, God, thank you. Thank you for what you've given me. Thank you how you made me. And this is the thing, because sometimes we're so focused on what we're not. That other person, you know, they, they have certain gifts that, that I don't have. And we get frustrated with our maker and say, God, why didn't you give me the talents that that person has? Why didn't you give me, allow me to be able to, to be like that other person? Use somebody else, actually, Lord, because I have not been created for that. Can I tell you something? That's what happened with Moses. The Bible says that Moses went before, the, the, with, before God, the consuming fire, and God said to him, I want you to preach. I want to, you to go in front of the Pharaoh and tell him to let his people go so that they may worship him. But Moses, he begins to put the excuse of the earthen vessel. But Lord... Look at me. I don't know how to speak. He says he stuttered. He had a speech impediment. But here's the thing. In whatever you are not, remember what God's response was to Moses. He said, Moses, I know you say you can't speak, but remember, I am. I am who I am. And therefore, any time that we're saying, God, I'm not good at speaking, God's response is, but I am. But I'm not good with networking with others, but I am. I'm not creative, but I am. See, God is the I am to your I'm not. Everything you are not, God says, I am. Come on. Woo. He is I am who I am. He is strong where you are weak. Where your limits are, that's where God surpasses. We need God. We are the earthen vessels, but it's what he deposits in us that gives us breakthrough. Woo. Okay, now I want to tell you this, also vessels are meant to be filled, right? But we must be careful what you are full of. In Luke chapter 4, we see that after the baptism of Jesus, when he was baptized, then the Bible says that full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, then he was led into the wilderness. This is, this is something that is key. For you to survive the wilderness, you need to be full of the Spirit, Full. He was full of the Spirit, and then he was led into the wilderness. And look at this. Jesus, you know, if we, if we look at all of our lives like vessels, imagine us to be like sponges, right? A sponge. When you place a sponge somewhere, what does it do? If you put water, it's going to soak up the water. And now this is what the devil likes to do. He likes to come into your life and squeeze you, put pressure on you with trials and tribulations. But what is going to come out of you is what's in you. And that's why the Bible says that when the devil showed up to Jesus to try to apply pressure into his life, he squeezed him, but guess what? He was full of the Spirit, so the Spirit came out of him. <laughs> See, pressure will come in your life, but whatever you are full of is what's going to spill out over in your life. If you're full of anger, guess what's going to happen when someone ticks you off? You're going to lash out. But guess what? If you're full of the Holy Spirit, even if people apply pressure to your life, it's all good. I love you, brother. I love you, sister. It's all good. If you want to be that type of Christian that always is able to respond well in moments of crisis and pressure, it's about what you're full of. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And let me tell you something. If you're currently in a trial or in a crisis, the crisis reveals what you were full of. And right now, if in trials and crises is where it's manifested, what we've been filling ourselves with. If we've been filling ourselves with just negativity, problems, and just pessimism and all of that stuff, that's what's going to be revealed in the moments of pressure. Okay. Now, um, now look at this. So Acts 10.38, I want to read this to you, and then I want to make another point. Speaking about the power of God. Remember, I haven't forgotten. I mentioned that we're going to define power. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, in Acts 10.38, look at what it says. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Can you say power with me? Okay. We are anointed 
with, uh, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Okay, what does it mean to be filled with po the power of God? What does it mean to be filled? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. What does it mean to be full of the power of God? It means also to display his works of glory, which is what? It says it right here. It says that he was doing good, he was healing all, and he was also uh, setting people free who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Can I tell you something? Is that many people, all they say is that to be Christ-like is just to have good character, to have his godly character. But I'm here to tell you that the early church fathers, not even the primitive church, understood it that way. They understood that the fullness of Christ was to display his godly character and also to manifest the power of Jesus. The way he walked here on earth is the way that we are to walk here on this earth. If he set people free, then that should be my mission, my standard. And I'm not going to put my standard to human standards. I'm going to put my standard to the standard of what the Bible says. And when I read the book of Acts, it fills me up with joy. And I just see how God would use people, earthen vessels, nothing special about them. But because the Holy Spirit was upon them, they began to do the same works that Jesus did. It means to be, that's what it means to be filled with power. Now, I, I want to be honest with you. In, in these couple of weeks, I've been uh, getting into like studying um, like never before. And, uh, and I've been speaking to my wife because, um, you know, I started hearing arguments that weren't settling in my heart. And back in the day, I would just take it as is. And what are these arguments? Well, I started just hearing what, what, you know, people who are cessationists would say. And who are people who are cessationists? Cessationists are those who believe that when the apostles died, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased. The miracles, the deliverance, all of that is gone. That's what cessationists believe. And so... I was hearing this cessationist person argue, and they were saying, well, if, if, uh, if, if God always wanted the gifts of the Holy Spirit to continue, then why don't we see it in the early church fathers? And I took that, and I'm like, yeah, maybe, that, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. But then God placed in my spirit to actually do the research. I used to take these types of things at just first hand and just say, oh, yeah, it must be true. Okay, it must be true. Maybe the way we're interpreting scripture is wrong. But I started looking at the early writings of the church fathers, and you would be surprised at what I found. First of all, cessationism, now I can say confidently, with confidence, that it comes as a lie from the pit of hell. And I can confidently say that because none of the early church fathers believed in cessationism. And why does that matter? Because first of all, before I even give you evidences, further evidences, just hear out my logic. First of all, sola scriptura, I believe in scripture alone. If scripture says it, I believe it. I don't even need early church fathers to back me up because if the word of God says it, I believe it. Sola Scriptura, I believe that. God's word alone has the ultimate authority. So I believe that. But when I started looking at the early church fathers, there was something important for me to see. How did the early church fathers interpret scripture? Because the, that's what I was hearing from cessationists. They were saying, the way that you guys interpret Scripture now was, is totally different. That's not how the old early church fathers interpreted it. But no, that is exactly how they were taught. Let me just give you a couple of examples, and then I'm going to show you a quote very quickly. But look, there was this guy called Justin Martyr. He was part of the, the second generation Christians, meaning the apostle had died. He was part of the second generation. Justin Martyr, he reports when he was fighting against this Jew that was arguing against Christianity. And in his letter, he says, he says literally this. He says, one of the proofs that we believe that we are the true church and that God is with us is that notice how your prophets don't prophesy anymore. But we still prophesy till this day. And he said the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still alive in our church today. That is a first, that is a second generation Christian talking. That is a second generation Christian talking. Now, what about a third generation Christian? Remember, the apostles had died. I want you to read. Who is Arrhenius? First of all, what's funny is that it, it's, this quote is literally found in his book called Against Heresies. Literally, and that's what's funny. Against heresies. So he's arguing against people who are heretical. And look at what he says. You, as I say this, you would think it's a Pentecostal preacher, you know, talking about testimonies of his campaign. 
But this is literally from back then. And I'll tell you why I'm quoting him and why he's important. Okay, look at this. It says, For some do certainly and truly drive out devils, so that those who have thus been cleansed from evil spirits frequently both believe in Christ and join themselves to the church. He's acknowledging deliverance still happens in our churches. And he says, because of deliverance, many people are coming to church. That's a third-generation Christian talking. What else? Then he says, others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and utter prophetic expressions. This is an argument I would hear from cessationists. They would say, no, nah, prophecy, all it means is to preach. That's all it means. Preaching the word of God, that's prophecy. But not according to the early church fathers. They said they had foreknowledge of things to come. They understood real prophecy. And it says they have visions and they uttered prophetic expressions. Look at this. Others still heal the sick by laying their hands upon them and they are made whole. Yeah, moreover, as I have said, the dead even have been raised up and remained among us for many years. And what shall I more say? It is not possible to name the number of the gifts which the church scattered throughout the world, whole world has received from God. Does that show cessationism to you? Does that show at all that they believe that at some point the, the, the gifts of the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit would cease? I'm telling you, and this is just one. I can even tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making like a YouTube video on this, and, and hopefully uh, it's something that, that you could watch. It's all of my, the things I've been starting to learn about the early church fathers. Not only that, but they've confirmed uh, the Trinity. They confirmed that Jesus is God. There's many things that they were confirming that is lost today, and nowadays... You know, we, we need to understand this, sola scriptura, but also understand that these early church fathers were closest to the primitive church. And the way they interpret scripture should matter to you and me. Not only that, I want you to see this. Why, is, why does Irenaeus, why does he matter? Why am I quoting him? I'll tell you why. Irenaeus, first of all, is a disciple of a man called Polycarp. Who is Polycarp? Polycarp is a direct disciple of the Apostle John. Who is the Apostle John? A disciple of Jesus. So look at this. You cannot tell me that they believed in cessationism or that's what the apostles taught. Because listen, Jesus taught miracles to his disciples, to Apostle John. And Apostle John then taught that to Polycarp. And Polycarp taught that to Irenaeus. Until Irenaeus' day, they were still seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. So don't you dare tell me that the early church did not believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. They were still understanding what the Bible taught. I'm telling you, even if, if a cessationist were to travel back in time and tell one of these early church fathers, you know, after the last apostle dies, isn't it true that the gifts would disappear? These early church fathers would be shocked. They would say, what are you talking about? Doesn't it say in scripture in Mark 16, 17, that these signs shall follow those who believe. They will speak in new tongues. They will cast out demons in my name. And they will lay their hands on the sick and they will be made well. If you don't believe me, even there's, uh, all, I, I went even further to further generations like Augustine. This guy Augustine, he even says that he literally witnessed a blind person that he began to see. And he said so many miracles were happening in his church. It's, uh, it was located in Hippo. And he had so many miracles that he said they could not be, I could not publish them because there were so many. It is, it is erroneous now. It is wrong for anyone to say that the early church believed that cessationism would be true. And anyways, why am I uh, uh, saying all of these things? It's to tell you and give you confidence that you are not misinterpreting scripture. You are interpreting scripture correctly. It's either cessationists in the 21st century have new knowledge and new revelation that, and, and, and us and the church fathers are wrong, or we're interpreting scripture correctly. And more than likely than not, we are interpreting scripture correctly. I believe in signs, miracles, and wonders. I believe that God is still alive. He's still baptizing people, and miracles are still happening today. We can believe in deliverance. Deliverance still happens today. That is part of the lifestyle of the church. And it was clear. John, the apostle John, he taught it not as a theory. He taught it as a lifestyle. Here you go, Polycarp. Here, I impart this to you as a lifestyle. And Polycarp taught it to Irenaeus. Here's a lifestyle that you should live, a life of power of God so we need to understand that and I understand why there are people who are skeptic and nervous about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit because there have been people who misused it but this is what I'm talking about vessels 
I want to be reserved for that type of things. That we would be able to say that God is still alive today. We are seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. And just like Irene is saying, that even the dead are being raised up. Let's believe and have the faith that the early church fathers had and that the primitive church had. How many of you guys want to be that type of vessel that wants to be used by God for his glory? I'm telling you, I've been like, like, my mind has been blowing up because I've always been tricked and lied by people. But when you look at things for yourself, you begin, your eyes will be open. And so I started to do my research and all of these things were coming up. Anyways, um, what I, I want to read to you 2 Kings chapter 4. I want to show you this. With the last few minutes that I have, um, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Then he said, Go borrow vessels at large for yourself and from all your neighbors, em even empty vessels. Do not get a few, and you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons, and pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. When the vessels were full, she said to her, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more, and the oil stopped. I don't have enough time to unpack all of this today, but what I want to summarize this is with this. That vessels represent your willingness and your availability. Your willingness and your availability. It says right here that Elijah was doing this miracle where he said to the woman, bring me as many vessels as you can and it will be filled. But the moment she stopped bringing vessels, the oil stopped. You know what that means? Is that our God is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is not going to force himself on you. If you don't want miracles, signs, and wonders in your life, that's fine. Don't bring him that vessel. And he, it's your prerogative. Will you go to heaven? Yeah, you're going to go to heaven because miracles is not a prerequisite for heaven. It's belief in Jesus. But if you bring that vessel and you want it, you are willing, God's going to fill it. The oil stops where you are no longer willing to bring another vessel. Isn't that crazy? So the question is, what do you want? How much do you want? How much do you want from God? Have you placed a limit and just said, God, this is, this is it. This is where I draw the line. I will believe in you, but that's it. Or will you take and bring another vessel and say, God, I want to be used for your glory. Just like the primitive church, I want to relive what the Acts church lived and what the early church fathers lived. If they were able to prophesy, Lord, I believe in the prophetic, use me in the prophetic. Lord, I believe that the old church used to heal the sick by the laying of hands. I want to be used by you to heal the sick with the laying on of hands. Not for my glory, but for the treasure that is inside of me. I'm just a vessel. He is the treasure. The question is, do you want to be filled? Do you want more? The oil will stop where you don't want it anymore. What does oil represent? It's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. This is different to his dwelling presence. He dwells in all of us. But the infilling of his presence is something that the Bible says be continuously filled. You will have as much as you want. You will have as much as you want. I want you to close your eyes where you are. And in fact, let's all stand up in our feet.